So there, yeah, a few things that I had planned to have devices for all of us, the programming devices, it didn't work out. The source code is not online yet either, so we have a, a few inadequacies to work around, but we are hackers, so we're excellent at producing workarounds when we need them. Um, I think success is defined by we have a badge, we want to program it, and we understand the workflow. Right? We kind of understand what we have to do maybe in the office at home if we want to change the behavior of our badge and a number of other similar devices because it's a similar workflow. Um, now, there's going to be, I'm going to show a few tools and we don't have a full day. We have an hour, an hour and a half. So these, the tool set I'll show is a very small subset of what's possible. This is always the case where um, there's a lot of different tools. This is just the way I'm doing it. And please feel free to ask if you think there's a better way or a, uh, a way you prefer. I, I might know about that. I can help you out. Um, before we get started, it might help to, uh, to distribute badges to the people. If you haven't purchased a badge and you would like to, in order to program it now, uh, if there's a small group that wants to do that, I think we can handle that quickly. Um, is there anybody who still wants to purchase a badge? Um, okay, so there's one or two people, that's fine. Um, in the meantime, because this will take a few minutes, uh, you may want to download, well first of all, if you haven't got an uh, internet connection set up, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you'll, You'll need to download some things. You can um, quietly, passively observe as well if you prefer, or if you don't have your computer with you and you just have a phone, it's fine. It's, you have fun with that as well. But there will be a hands-on um, uh, component to this workshop. And it's over an hour long, so we have enough time to do that. Um, what we will be downloading, um, this is my preference at least, uh, it's called Platform IO. I don't know if I can make this bigger. I'll try. Yeah, that seems to work. Well, the title bar doesn't get bigger, but the URL is simply platform. Uh, sorry, platformio.org. So you want to maybe read through there a bit, and you want to learn how to download and install it. What it really involves is downloading Atom, but it's all on the page there for installation. And while you do that, um, I think we'll, we'll just take care of the, um, the one badge that we still have need to, to get set up. And I'll turn the microphone off. Yeah, there's going to be two things that we, that if each of us want to individually uh, program on our own computers, we'll need two things two new things that you may not have yet. That's this platform IO. And there's a, a command line um, utility. It's called AVR Dude. So this is how I installed AVR Dude. I know I'm getting too far ahead, but for anybody who's quite advanced, I don't want to get you bored. And so, um, well, first of all, let's do a search. If you're on a, a DPKG, style distribution, um, then you use a APT or, or something. Obviously, the RPM ones are, are Z Yum, Zyper, and so on. Um, abdk, so we can search for uh, AVR. Dude. Ah, so it's kind of running off the end, but I think it's clear enough. Um, this is the other, this, so this is not platform IO. This is the second. Uh, software, a piece of software that I'm talking about, which is part of our um, uh, suite or our workflow. Um, so we will need platform IO and we will need AVR Dude. And both of these two pieces have alternatives, but with a limited amount of time, it's going to be kind of a demonstration using the tools that I've been using before. So um, having said that, short explanation of what programming means and how a badge starts out. So imagine, uh, in, that, in fact, you can see that three of these badges, there's four, um, three of them are lit up. That's because there's a microcontroller 
uh, controlling the LEDs and doing things with them, turning them off and turning them off on in succession to create this animation, right? That's a program that's running on the MCU, just like a program could run on a MPU, uh, um, um, a microprocessor unit. This is a microcontroller unit. And one of the big differences is that the storage of a microcontroller unit is directly inside, embedded inside the, uh, the, the plastic housing of the chip. So this is what some people um, refer to as uh, on-chip debugging or on-chip programming. It's a very different uh, procedure as what we have with the MPUs. The question? Right. Um, so Atom is what you'll probably choose. Atom is a generic um, web editor, which I think, what is it, GitHub uses? or what, Is that right? GitHub kind of develops Atom for general use to, um, yeah, it's an editor. And the beauty of Atom is that you can load um, plugins, components on top of that to make it a, a full-fledged IDE, for example, which platform IDE is. That's what they're using for it. Now, I assume that if it gives you a second option, v VS Code or whatever, that you can try that as well. It sounds like a, a more Microsoft-style um, you know, uh, type of thing if you want to experiment with that. If you have a Microsoft dis distribution running on your computer, maybe it's a better choice. Um, I'll try to help, but <laughs> I don't have any experience with Microsoft. In any case, um, so back to what these microcontrollers are doing with the lights. So uh, they're controlling the lights in a very simple way, turning on, turning off. That's what a microcontroller does. When I receive them from the factory, I receive them on a reel like this, and there are 1,000 or 1,500 microcontrollers on there, on these little chips, right? And then I, uh, I place them on these boards, solder them um, so that they are uh, yeah, soldered onto the board. And as soon as I flip the switch and turn it on with a battery or an energy source, basically nothing happens because the factory does not know if I'm controlling lights or if I'm uh, detecting a door that opens or if I'm measuring voltage or measuring temperature. They just have no idea what my application is. So they arrive in an empty state. That's kind of what would happen if I turned it on. This one here is not lit up. It simply wouldn't light up because there's no program inside. And that's what this workshop is about, to find a way to get our own programs inside the MCU so that when you turn them on, it does what you want. Uh, question. Another question. How do you start designing these batteries? Is there a private site like Google or just kind of get some ideas on the games or whatever Yeah, it's, it, it's not relevant, but I like the question. <laughs> It's not, so the question is how do I, I think it's kind of personal, how do I start to design a new badge? Um, uh, this, okay, well, I, I'll give you a very practical answer. I'm designing badges for, for a quite well-known cryptocurrency conference in Europe, which will take place in October. I don't know if they want me to announce this because the badges will control entrance and it's quite expensive. <laughs> so they probably don't want people to know th how to knock off the badges. And um, so this is, a, this is a, a full set of requirements that they're giving me. They're asking me questions about uh, are they able to change the shape? Can there be circles? Can there be route outs? Can there be squares? And these are all questions I have to answer. Uh, I won't get too far into it, but for example, the route outs need to have round edges. Because what they're doing is uh, sinking a drill a bit into the PCB and then uh, going around and, and, um, and removing a uh, surface area. So there's always going to be a round area. These are the kind of things you talk to customers or groups or co-workers, colleagues, project um, uh, people. And that's kind of how I get started. And then usually it's a, there's a lot of chaos involved. Um, and then t which, how cheap can I get the LEDs? Oh, they're only green, but I don't like that. But then, you know, trade-offs, okay. Cheapness, wrong color, whatever. You know, I don't have any, any better answer than that. Um, yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> There's going to be plenty of other badges involved. In, um, so, 
um, right. Um, that's what happens when I get these uh, MCUs on a big reel from the factory. They're empty, I put them on the board, solder them, and then I need to program them. That's what everybody needs to do. And that not everybody is producing uh, hardware, but this is relevant for anybody here if you want to change the behavior of uh, the MCU because they're not locked down or anything. You can just uh, erase them so that they're factory state again or overwrite them with your own uh, 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 firmware. This is not called software. Software would be if you uh, connected a USB cable to this and there was USB communication to your computer and then you opened up a web browser or something and then had some type of software, host software running. A lot of people believe they're, they're, they're running software on the, um, on the uh, badge or the wallet or something else when it's really only running on the, on the notebook and that's software. What's running inside the MCU, this little chip in the corner, that's firmware. That's, it's important to know that distinction, right? Um, okay, so I don't see too many computers, but that's fine. Um, we'll get started with a quick demonstration and then I think whoever is following along and, and trying to do hands-on uh, will slow it down then and I'll pay some individual attention to try to get things working. Does that sound okay? There's kind of one or two. <laughs> I think there's two computers in the room. All right, that's fine. Um, okay, so the first thing is a demonstration. I'm going to show how to change the behavior of, let's say, I don't know, I'll take this corner one down here. So I will change that. What we have so far, okay, so let me just, let me, let me create a new file. Um, I have already downloaded Node uh, Platform I.O. and installed it. So, when I, can we see this? Right. So when I type Adam, uh, you can't see that on that screen. If, okay, so if I did this, then, I would be presented with the Atom screen. And this is kind of the first thing I always see, an error message. <laughs> That's how it looks when you've installed Platform I.O. Now I'm a bit concerned. I think I have two copies of Atom running. I'll try to get rid of one of them so I'm not using memory unnecessary. Yeah, there's two there. All right, so now we have one only. Um, I think you have Adam as well. Um, have you found a way to install platform IO on your Adam? Okay, but it's a, it's working all, yeah. It, no questions about it yet? <laughs> okay, it's a package that you need to search for, I believe. Um, I believe it's, uh, let's see. There is something up here, packages. This is Adam and how to... Yeah, I'm not sure how. Hmm. I myself have forgotten how this works to install more packages. Maybe help. Adam, welcome guide. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So once you do see the the first screen, you can install a package here. Open installer, search packages, platform IO, and there we go. Binary package, 
The, the first step is this platform IO uh, IDE, and all this does is allow us to edit a new program and uh, compile it. Um, right, we the, compile it to the correct architecture, which is not Intel or AMD or ARM. In this case, we're doing uh, Atmel AVR 8-bit. So that's the first thing that we're trying to do. That's what we're using Platform I.O. for. Right, and so um, once you have the Atom editor installed, what I just did it helps you find the Platform I.O. packages, and that's how you can install it. Mine just says uninstall because I already have it. Um, I think there are two here to install, but that's all in the information of that Platform I.O. website where it explains how, how to install it. Did you get so far? Have you had any problems? Tomorrow, yeah. It's the other way around. Atom is the basis. Exactly. What's the question? You... So, so to get Platform I.O., you need to register with them? What? I don't think so. Right, that's the only person you brought to me. That's why I'm asking. No, no, no. You don't have to register anything. Um, I know that Platform I.O., they, they optionally, I think there is some method to register, but I've never done it. So I don't think it's needed. Did you, uh, did you try the, the searching for, for packages inside the Atom editor the way that I did this? It, that might, may be the distinction. There may be many ways to use Platform IO, and and I know that there's. It's a very small group. I, I know the guy doing that. So. No, he's in Europe. He's he wasn't he was invited to the village, but he couldn't make it. Okay, we're back there. I'm just trying to find a... This link. This is interesting.
Oh, here, that's my screen there. <laughs> God. Okay. Hello, world. All right. Okay. So I already have my platform I.O. set up. I'm just going to do this as a demonstration while they're still getting set up so that everyone knows a bit about how this is supposed to work. Um, I search from the help menu has a about, or no, has a welcome guide. And in the welcome guide, there is on the right, at least for me, there is install a package. And under, I think, yeah, under that, there's open installer. And where can you, yeah, and at the top of that, you can search for platforms. Just be careful to, to uh, type return after your text because it, otherwise it doesn't search automatically. Right. So I'll remove the settings and the welcome. I don't need the welcome guide. Okay, so platform IO. What I'm now interested in is making sure I can compile for the Atmel AVR 8-bit uh, ISA, the instruction set, uh, which, is, um, for, which is what we're using with these MCUs. Because these MCUs are not uh, ARM-based, they're not made by Texas Instruments, they're not Intel, etc. They are from Atmel, and they use AVR 8-bit instruction sets. So I'm going to look for uh, platforms, I think is the correct area here. And for whatever reason, the first one that comes up <laughs> is Atmel AVR, because it starts with A, I believe, is maybe um, alphabetical. And just to show you, if you're curious what else is available, there are Expressive, there's, I think these are all the ones I have installed, so there's not many, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's two that you need. It's a platform IO dash IDE and platform IO. Let me just show you the ones that I have. So I have platform IO dash IDE, and it's possible that by simply installing platform IO dash IDE, it will uh, install the dependencies as well. If that doesn't happen, and you suspect that something is not behaving correctly, then you will see that I also have platform IO dash IDE dash terminal. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's needed or not. You can test and try on your own. I just have those two. Right, so what I was doing just a minute ago is, okay, I'll give you a, a short one minute tour. If I click on boards here, it's probably gonna show things like Arduino, like Booster Pack, like, uh, well, let's see, it's got Bitsy, there's quite a lot here. Our uh, Adafruit, Blue, whatever, Blue Fruit Micro, there's 96 boards, and there's just quite a lot of things. I mean, 15 to a page. We can do 1,000, though. Let's do 100 to a page. And 
And alphabetical again, so there's lots of Ada fruit. Arduino must be the next one, exactly. So there's Arduino Due, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of boards. You get the idea what a board is defined as in the platform IO world. And at the, at the bottom, there's a BBC micro bit, for example. I think some of you know what that is. As far as libraries go, if I click on that in platform IO, it's going to give me uh, options to load libraries to control um, serial buses uh, like I squared C or maybe temperature modules um, f which work on digital basis or analog. Um, these are all the libraries. So we have sensor libraries, li control libraries, etc. Let me just see the ones I have installed to give you an idea. Um, what, I have none? <laughs> That's impossible. What's built in? So, Explora, Ethernet, GSM, these are the type of libraries. So we've taken a look at boards, libraries, uh, devices at the very bottom. I, oh, devices is simply what platform IO has detected is connected to your computer. So if you have a USB connection, serial, or I don't know what the other options are, I guess over Ethernet, um, those are the devices that it tells you you have connected. Possibly if I connect my programmer, it will detect that. Let's just see if that's the case. Refresh. I kind of doubt it will work, but it is connected over USB, so maybe uh, it didn't work. Okay, well, I'm not going to spend time with that anyway. The very last of all of these areas, which make any sense, I mean, we've seen the home already, and the account, I don't have an account. It's not, it's not needed. Um, the very last that, I, that I've shown is now the platforms. And as I mentioned, there's a few here, Tiny, uh, Teensy, Espressive. These are the ones that I have installed. There are quite a lot of others, um, and Admiral AVR is the one that we need to use to program these badges because that's the architecture and instruction set. Um, so I hope that's clear enough. So this is kind of very complex IDE that gives you a lot of features and functionality. It's definitely more than the Arduino IDE, although you could use it as well. Um, we don't have enough time to do every IDE in the world and Visual Studio and whatever else. You can probably find a plug-in for that as well. But we're going to stick to Platform I.O. Um, I like it. And so here there will usually be um, maybe some, uh, let's see what it gives us. Sometimes we get examples and things, AVR 8 and 32-bit MCUs. Here, examples, for example. And the, under boards, it tells you what boards are using the AVR 8-bit and 32-bit instruction set. What I like to do is go right to examples. You see that here? It's kind of hard to see at an angle for all of you. But if you take a look at examples, you have a few different ones, like Arduino Blink is this one. You can choose that, but you can choose a lot of others as well. Arduino Blink is good enough for us. And you can kind of see the style of, of the things you need to do. Uh, this is not so interesting, the I and I file. Let's see all the files we have. This one is maybe good. So this is kind of, oh, this is all there is. <laughs> so that makes it a great first case example. That's all you need to program and type. And just like all, um, Atmel or at least Ar Arduino framework programs, you have a setup um, block and then a loop block. The setup just does things one time and the loop will obviously loop. This is kind of the, the way microcontrollers are, are made to work. And if you look at the, the source code there, it's kind of small, but I think you can see it well enough. It's very simple. It does a delay so that your blinks are separated by a delay of some amount. And the digital write is simply setting a voltage on a GPIO pin, which in this case is 
the LED built-in pin somewhere in a, in a header file that's defined, I think, as pin number 13 or something. And you set it as high, and okay. So that's really very clear and easy. And that's, that's similar to what we're doing here um, <laughs> on a very basic level. There is a couple problems. If you, this is, this is not so intuitive, but if you take a, a close look at the badge, you count the number of contacts on the MCU, there are eight. Now, two of those are immediately used for the ground uh, plane and the uh, voltage um, pin. So you have six left. And because there is a button connected to that, a tactile switch, that will take up one more and you have five um, possible inputs and outputs, GPIO, general purpose input, in or out. So you, with five contacts, you're trying to drive 16 LEDs. And if you look at the structure of a program, you, you apply a voltage to one pin and it turns it on through the high uh, parameter or it turns it off through the low. So you can do that to five different LEDs and all the other L 11 LEDs, you wouldn't be able to touch them. There would be no direct connector, connection to the, to the five uh, contacts on the MCU. So um, it's been a long time since this, this problem has been solved and basically um, it's a multiplexing problem where you want to have uh, more than one uh, input or output for, for one contact on the MCU and it's called Charlie plexing. I can't remember why. Maybe the person who solved the problem for the first time is named Charlie. I don't know. Does anybody know? <laughs> anyway, so that's what we're doing here. We're doing Charlie plexing. So we're connecting a, a multiple of, um, of LEDs with a resistor in between and uh, it's, it's a bit complicated and not worth mentioning in detail. but. Um, this is what we're doing. We're just doing it in a more complex manner so that we can control more LEDs with the, sh with the small amount of contacts we have from the MCU. So um, what should we do? We could, we could compile this and if we're really lucky, this LED, which is defined as LED built in, would map to one of the LEDs which I've, with, which I've chosen. I'm actually quite curious because I haven't tried this. I mean, it's a 50-50, it's a less than 50-50 chance, but let's try it. So um, to compile this, how do we do that? Somewhere there must be, I've kind of forgotten from the, um, from the examples how to compile. How do we do that? So I'm just going to cut and paste, I think. Whoops. <laughs> That's too much text. Let's just imagine that for the first time we're, we're getting exposed to a new platform. We don't know how it works. So I'm just going to create a new project. I've totally forgotten how. <laughs> okay, let's go back home. New project here from the home screen project name. Er, DEF CON test board. And we will do. Um, what is the correct board name here? I'm going to cheat here because there is uh, the board is called AT Tiny. We're still in demonstration mode, so this this may go a bit too fast. AT Tiny, and it's 13A. There it is. And framework that we want is Arduino location, use the default location, finish. So this is now creating a new project called DEF CON test. And I have on the left here now, DEF CON test and libraries, everything's set up the way I need to. So it did a bunch of work for me. 
I even have a main.cpp uh, area with a loop and a setup. So I'm just going to erase this because I have copied the example from before. See that? So this is what I copied before. And it's the, the blink example for the Arduino. Because it is AVR 8 bit, it, it can possibly work. I'm just concerned about this here. This might not work. But because I'm an adventurous person, I'm just going to try and compile it. Uh, up here, there is a build. Uh, save and build. Fail. This file has been moved to util delay h. It's been moved to util delay h. No. All right. So that was a good try, but I'm going to quit while, while we're still on time. Um, instead of doing that, I'm going to take source code from from what I know is good. Let's get rid of this here. How do I get rid of this? You mean that there? Yeah. Build target. All right. Uh, target, target. I just know, what do you mean build target? What do you want me to do there? No. Um, yeah, I think trying to use an example from a different board <laughs> is, uh, this, this was kind of an exotic test that I wanted to try. So I'm going to erase the text that I just copied there. And we're still in demonstration mode. So I'm going to copy this file, which I know is good. It's not the one that's running on the badges exactly because that's not uploaded yet. But I'm, I'm quite sure that it will work. And we'll need one more file. This looks OK, right? And we need one more file. We need this one. Yeah, this is C. So I will create a new file in this pro project and put that inside there and it's untitled we'll call it we'll call it main.h I hope that's the right place oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah no. just put it in temp All right, it's not in the right place, so let me just put it there now. Um, projects plat. That's it. And over here. Large, flat. So, and then we'll move it to where it should be, namely DEF CON. Oh, where did God, where did it go? So now I need to find the place where this new project is stored. Manager. Platform documents, platform IO projects. All right, sorry about this. Documents. Documents. Platform IO and projects, DevContest, projects. 
So that must be correct now, but it's still not now. OK, so that looks OK. Our main.h is in the correct place. Main.cpp is looks OK as well. Oh, it, I, haven't, I haven't saved it. So I'll just save all the files now. Save all. And I have the home here. I have the CPP here. And, and there is a main H as well. Let's cross our fingers. I saw a lot of red there. I'm not sure why. Oh, no configuration. Ah, OK. That's why. Um, so platform IO, AT tiny. And it's saying no configuration. Oh, now it works OK. OK, success. So what I just did was I cut and pasted a bunch of uh, source code, which I know works for this um, architecture. And the pin assignments are similar to what I used for the LEDs soldered onto the board. So that's, this is not exactly what's running on these boards, because that source code, I, I'm too disorganized in that right now, and I haven't uh, uploaded it yet. But this does work, and I have copied it into this file. And there's a main age file as well, a header, which is not very long. And so I just built it. I can build again to show you. It goes pretty fast. So build, and then it, down here, basically says what it's doing, and it succeeded. What it did really is used a gcc.avr um, version of the compile, compiling environment. This is, this is not Intel, but it did a lot of tricks because it understands what, um, what architecture it's building for. And I should be able to find the binary now. If I just go back one, and let me put this at the top. I think it's called, yeah, it's in here, an AT Tiny 13. And there it is. There's the um, firmware. Well, let's show both of them. The hex is the one that we're going to copy over this one here. So now, um, let's see, the AVR dude. Command. I've kind of forgotten how it is, but I can find it quickly. All right, here it is. So the next thing we need to do here is AVR Dude takes a binary. It does other things as well, but it takes a binary like the one we just produced, and it programs a uh, chip like this one over a USB connection. So we don't have USB logic in this hardware. So we'll need some kind of middleman that understands the USB commands and everything coming from AVR Dude, and then uh, transfers it in a method in a in a in a protocol that can handle, which is SPI, the Serial Peripheral Interface. So that's what I'll demonstrate now. Um, Firmware.hex, I think that's the name of the file. We're going to flash that and write. This is a command. I'm going to change the fuses. I think we need to ignore. The fuses is, is basically we, the, every microcontroller has an in, usually an internal clock. You can tell it to, uh, to reduce the clock speed. You can sometimes. Um, change a fuse so that it's no longer programmable. There's internal fuses. These are the type of things that AVR Dude can manipulate. Um, and here I'm telling it to uh, release the, the, the halving of the, an internal oscillator. When you get these chips from the factory, they're um, made to run very slow. And if we did that, then all of this animation would just be very slow. It wouldn't be nice. So I always. Um, release this, uh, this, this fuse, the 3A fuse. 
Right, and this is the programmer that I have, which is the C command, and if I do nothing at all, because it's not connected to anything, it will give me some errors. Right, command failed because it's not connected to anything. But if I do it again after I connect the programmer, which looks like this, I'll try to raise this up a bit. I mean, it's going to be hard to see, I apologize, but but you can understand that my computer is this, and then if, okay, I've got a couple cables for power and so on, and this white thing here is an Atmel, um, it's called an ICE, I'm not sure what that stands for. It's a um, serial programmer. So this is necessary because um, there's no way to connect a, a, a serial or a, or I'm sorry, a USB cable directly to this uh, board. If you have a board like a Raspberry Pi or something where you can directly connect an, a USB cable to it, then you can program directly. And it's kind of a bad example because a, a Raspberry Pi has no microcontroller. But because we don't have that, we need a serial programmer like this. Okay, so now I'm going to connect that to, to this orange uh, board at the bottom. When I turn this on for the first time, that's the animation that begins. It's a fast animation. When I click, it, moves, it goes to a slow animation. And the third option is kind of a strange Cylon thing there. Okay, so I think the, so I'm going to connect and program the new thing on there. Um, if I can just, there we go. So this should work now. Oops, that happens sometimes. Oh, I didn't have it on, okay. I think we're still okay. So these are the files, and now I'm gonna turn it on. Okay, now that's working. You can see it's writing at the bottom. And if you look at the badge, it's, it's lighting up a lot of the LEDs. So now it's no longer beginning with the fast animation. It's a bad example. I should have done something more pronounced. It's starting with a slow animation. The next one is a fast animation. The third one, yes, yeah, <laughs> I did almost the same thing. Okay, to make this more pronounced, I'm going to change the source code, and that will be the end of the demonstration, and I'll walk around and try to get people started on doing other things. Um, we can change things, I think, close to the bottom here. So here's this, the loop. We'll start with, we'll start with a, we'll start with five. We'll just do five, zero, one, two, three. And that means that our maximum, I think it's at the top, three is the max. Was it, yes, three. So this should be correct. So I will go back, build, success, and Connect. Uh, I can't see. Okay, connect and program. Take a look at the badge if you can see it. While I'm programming, it's going to light up. It's interrupting all of the. Exactly. Okay. So now I turn it off, turn it on, and you can see that it has a new program on there. The very first animation is different. If I switch to the next animation, it's a different one. Switch to the third, and there is no fourth, I believe. Or maybe, okay, there's, the fourth is the, the default end of 
animation, animation, and the first one comes back on. So I think that kind of demonstrated how this workflow works, right? Um, there are lots of options. Instead of Platform.io, you can use Arduino, you can use um, uh, AVR GCC and make files. There's different things to uh, achieve the same results. I think we still have a half hour or so. So at this point, I'll take some questions and then walk around and try to help those with computers um, do what they're trying to do. Any questions? Right. Well, the one that I have, which I can tell works pretty well for Atmel architectures, is called the Atmel ICE. They have different versions of that. I think a few years ago they started with one. I'm not sure which one I have. Maybe it says a number. <laughs> I don't know. It just says Atmel ICE on there, and then there's a serial number and a date. So that'll work just fine. They're they're a bit expensive though. I think they're. $80, $90, something like that, and they're not worth it. Why do I say that? Because um, an Arduino will work just fine, almost anything. There's all kinds of uh, uh, hacky projects. If you look at Hackster.io or, um, or a lot of online sites, um, you can download your own PCB from Oshpark, populate it, and create a programmer on your own. I mean, obviously, the easiest answer for you if you're trying to get started easily and quickly is to do the same exact thing that I did and then copy that model number down and just pay the money and, and get it and it will work just fine. Um, the other thing that I, may, I might say is that there are two interfaces. That's where you can plug things in onto these badges because I know some people, um, well, p people have different preferences, right? There is the, they, they both have six contacts, so they're very easy to identify. In fact, going to the badge website, which you, you maybe didn't know there was a website. Um, it's this here. This is what I'm talking about. These, these little um, interfaces there with six contacts. One of them, there are six holes. And in the other one here, the, there's six contacts as well, but there are, they're not holes through the board. Either one of those work to program the boards. The one that the hand is pointing at now, it's called a tag connect interface. And the other one above, this is the traditional, actually it's just 2.54 millimeter uh, pitch um, <laughs> header pins. It's not really a name, but it's, uh, it's a traditional Arduino um, programming interface. So some, some uh, programmers, Ha come with cables for one or another, or even there are many other uh, types. Question? So there are, there's only one MCU, and the other two chips um, are non-programmable. They simply are storage, like a USB, you know, uh, media stores things. Right, so you don't have to worry about those as far as pro programming goes, and that's why there are no interface plugs or connectors there. The connector really is just a, uh, um, a wireless connector um, on the back is the antenna. That's how you access those, and that's the interface. The interface for the lights portion, that's what we're talking about now. And depending on what you like best, what I like best is, is this tag connect interface because of the way that I can very quickly program. I push down, it, it has, the tag connect cables have um, kind of a spring action pogo pin um, uh, assembly on there. So I can very quickly go from one to the next board and there's no attaching a cable. But um, I'm, I must say that most people are more comfortable with the header pins and the traditional Arduino uh, plugs. And it works just as well, and they're more available, they're cheaper. So that's why I put both of those on there. And if I wanted to go crazy, I could probably do three or four other alternatives. All I would do is put traces on there. It would be really easy, but it would be more confusing as well. And, and I would be populating more parts anyway. It's not important. So, the, so you have two choices on where to plug in. When I just plugged in myself, um, it's too small to show you, but I, I used, I, I connected to this here. 
to this, uh, I can't get it, there it is, to that. And that is when, and that is when you saw all of this writing and verifying happen. AVR Dude is what programmed the badge. Any other questions? Yeah, um, well, there are, two, there are two people. There's AGS and there's me. We're selling the badges. AGS has uh, packages of badges for anyone who bought over his website. It was a pre-sale um, that, uh, that happened a couple weeks ago, I guess, and a lot of people bought badges, and he has their order numbers, so you need your order number if you did that. If you uh, didn't buy it during that time, then I have badges as well um, for sale. In fact, I have all three now. The problem yesterday, I wasn't sure how many I had of all three, and I had orders to fill, so I was telling people we were sold out. It wasn't, <laughs> I thought we were, but and I was being honest, but we're not sold out. I think I have a couple handful left of the high value pr uh, premium badges, and I have a couple boxes of the regular ones. Um, any other questions? Was that halfway clear, the workflow where we started with Platform.io, we, we typed, we edited, we, we um, developed and coded, we built and compiled, and then we had a f uh, firmware file which ends with .hex, and then we used AVR Dude to program that over a USB device onto the board. What does it do without any Without any modifications, I can't show it anymore because I <laughs> overwrote mine. But they all, all of the badges that I sell, that I've produced, um, are the same as, what's that? Um, let me rephrase that. There are three different uh, models, right? There is the regular, there is the uh, alien, nice blue uh, color. And then there is the boss badge with the, the two-tone colors and kind of the author, authoritative uh, animation. Um, whatever, whichever you choose, um, your animation will match every other person that has chosen that badge. Uh, I don't know if that, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question. I'm just. <laughs> yeah. Right, so after you switch it on, the first animation appears just like every, everyone else, and you can change that by clicking on the switch. You need to hold it down because it only samples at the end of the animation. So sometimes you, you click too quickly and it won't register it. But if you click at just the right time or if you hold it down long enough, then it will register. And then it, it um, uh, goes to the next animation, which, I, which is part of the source code. Whoops. Where is it? which I just modified in order to change the sequence, right? Um, and that's all that you can do with one button. You see, it's a, quite a limited device, right? This is not measuring temperature or you don't have a screen to uh, get menus and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. So the question is, um, does it have NFC features? And the answer is yes. Um, it's difficult to answer because, okay, first of all, I call this a split-brained badge because there are really two sides to it, and that's why I wrote lights on one side and radio on the other. And there is no communication between the two sides. What would be very nice and what would be for the, for the, I think the battery's running out. Does anybody have batteries for the microphone? Um, what we'll be working on for the next version of badges for the next conference in uh, Europe is that once we place the, uh, the badge onto a NFT device, um, the microcontroller understands that and lights things up. It's going to be a bit different. It's good. But um, that will require that there's communication from the NFC radio side to the MCU powered lights side. And our situation here at DEF CON, this is a split brain. There is no communication between the two sides. So if you lay this onto an NFC uh, reader writer, an active NFC device which can supply power like a phone, then your radio uh, 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 logic, your radio circuits will work 
but the MCU won't have any idea about it. You can even have the, the badge turned off, you can turn, take the battery out, and the radio circuit still works. Um, the, the way to use that, so there are two, two buttons over there as well. Um, try to imagine a NFC tag, you know, a library card, or whatever has an NFC antenna loop inside. I, I can't, I'm, I'm not, a, not feeling too creative after so much lack of sleep, but if you can imagine an NFC application, maybe in your school or whatever, door access control sometimes. Sometimes it's an RFID um, uh, device, but it's very similar in any case. There's an, a, a connected antenna, and there's no uh, uh, energy source for one of the two sides, for the passive side. Um, anyway, so this is the same thing with one exception. Instead of simply lying it on the reader and the reader automatically recognizing, picking up, and taking the information, which could lead to opportunistic data theft, in, for example, if you, imp, if you uh, for example, embed an a antenna on a table, that would be great at DEF CON, right? You're stealing people's data left and right their wallets going on the table and you're reading their library card information, whatever. What we decided is to block or defend against that by putting switches on here. So if you lay your badges on a, a table that was uh, manipulated by an attacker, they will not be able to get your data. It doesn't mean you should store um, critical data on here. I recommend against that. But um, it does mean that you have a bit of protection because you must use your finger and push on one of those two tactile switches. And at that moment, a reader or a writer can access the NFC circuit. Only then you take your finger off and you're safe again, or marginally safe, safer than usual, right? Does that make sense? So if you have your library card and um, you go to, what, a coffee shop and they have sometimes embedded um, uh, chargers on the table and you might have your telephone there and your library card here, they can take your data easy enough. I mean, if you own the coffee shop and you embed an antenna on there, there's going to be one customer who puts their wallet on the table and then you have their data. Um, but if that customer had a, um, a, a blocking factor, something like a tactical switch, um, tactile switch like these here, then they, would be, then they would need to first push on that to complete the circuit with the antenna, and only at that moment can data be read out of this or written to it. And, and the, I can talk a bit about how to use an NFC tag in general, but this is kind of a... Uh, uh, this is, there's probably, if you search online, you know, uh, uh, NFC tag, this is, it's very basic. Um, I don't have examples, um, but a lot of, a lot of what, um, library cards, for example, have RFID or NFC embedded inside the plastic. You don't really see it unless, sometimes you can with a very bright light. Um, that's a radio circuit and an extremely s uh, small chip inside as well which basically stores a very small amount of data. So it's, it's, it stores uh, a number for you, an anonymized number. So your um, library um, uh, customer 568540 or whatever, you lay down your, your um, library card on the reader and then you can check out books, books that way. And if you don't return the, your books, then they match your number to your name and address and send you a bill, right? So that's one of about 50 million applications for a contactless um, uh, uh, radio application. Contactless just means you're not plugging cables in and creating uh, copper or physical connections. It's going over up to one and a half millimeters of distance of space. It's a wireless uh, interface. So that's what you have in these badges as well. All three of the badges which I sell have this feature. The only difference is that the less expensive, I, I, like, I like to keep prices as low as you imagine. You can, you can see what prices are at DEF CON. I like this because it's kind of democratizes badges. Um, it's hard to find cheap badges at DEF CON. I like that you know, anybody, regardless of how much money they have, can have a badge. But that means that I have to put less uh, high-rated um, components on here. So the tactile switches are a bit uh, clumsier. They're not as nice. They not, they're not low profile. They click a lot. And uh, the, the NFC EEPROMs don't store very much uh, information. They can just store two kilobits of data and uh, the others can store 64 kilobits. 
So yeah, people are always asking what the differences are. Those are a few of the differences. Any other questions? You're welcome. Um, oh, this the screen is off. I was kind of I was kind of hoping to get a bit further with hands-on, well, which isn't so relevant if we just have one or two people with computers in the whole room. Um, but I think in other parts of the world, maybe again at DEF CON next year, we'll have uh, similar situations where instead we'll be better prepared and we'll have uh, uh, one uh, programming device for each um, of us at each uh, table position, for example. That was my plan, I just didn't get to it. Um, but I did do the demonstration, and I think that kind of clarified a bit um, of what must happen after one of these chips comes from a manufacturer, ST Microelectronics, or no, in, in this case, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, Atmel itself, um, comes to the producer, that's me, and then they solder that on, and it's empty. What has to happen then in order for anything like lights to appear? Right? You need to develop, compile, and then program. That's kind of the workflow, just in a nutshell. Yeah, so there is, there is little, to, there's still, you know, 10 minutes, but I think most questions have been answered, and we don't really have much time left. So I think we'll um, end it early, if it's okay with you. Uh, one last question. Yeah, that's fine. Should I come over to you? I'll, I'll wrap up here and then. Or, or is it a question that I can answer like this? Yeah. Okay, that's what we'll do next.